book of Zechariah, chapter 14. It's going to deal with the final siege of Jerusalem and the return and the reign of the Messiah. A climax, not just of the book, but of history. And uh, as you know, Zechariah can be divided into three parts. The first six chapters being the night visions, then the next two chapters being priestly council, seven and eight. But then we have from nine to the end, deals with the whole foundation uh, to the preparations for the second coming and the acceptance of the Messiah by Israel. In chapters 12 and 13 that we've just been through, set the stage for what we're going to look at tonight, chapter 14. Now one of the things as we go through this, I'm hoping you will carry away, is not just the prophecies of Zechariah and not just what he reveals to us about eschatology or study of the last days, the last things. There's something else that I think may help us get things in perspective, and that is it's clear if you read the commentators that there's no way that any of this can apply historically. Obviously, as we get into especially chapters 12, 13, and 14, What's portrayed there certainly has not happened yet. It's yet future. But it's also entirely prophetic and climactic, uh, not just of Zechariah, but of the book of the Bible itself. We're going to see in this chapter the closing of a period of time that the Bible refers to as the times of the Gentiles. But there's there's something else that another um, aspect of this text. And uh, if you want to evaluate some pastor or teacher or commentator, um, you'd like to know his position in general, all you need to do is ask him to interpret Zechariah 14 for you. And that will intrinsically reveal volumes about his entire perspective of the Scripture. And uh, as you study the chapter, think about that. It certainly emphasizes the reality of Israel and its future in God's plan and puts to death, if you will, many of the more commonly held views about um, the church replacing Israel. We saw it last uh, in chapter 13 that two-thirds of Israel is going to get wiped out. And I think it's pretty hard to visualize two-thirds of the church being wiped out. In other words, you start trying to apply the church to all these passages having to do Israel, it becomes pretty quick that somebody is out of touch. Well, let's just let's go ahead and jump right in. Zechariah chapter 14. It really is a, a, just an expansion of the last verse that we looked at last time, uh, verse 9 of uh, chapter 13, dealing with the purging, if you will, of the nation Israel. In chapter 14, verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Now, what it actually says is, Yom ba le Yahweh, uh, which is the day is coming, the Lord's. And to give you some feeling of this, I, uh, Unger, as one of the exegetical commentators, points out that this, this distinctively and preeminently uh, is his day. The Lamed before the uh, Yahweh denotes possession belonging to. The author wished to accentuate the certainty of the coming of the day by employing the future in- instans and therefore attaching the participle directly to day. In other words, the way the Hebrew structure, you can extract all this out of it. So making a, a, a construct chain impossible, but achieving an added stress on a day, the Lord's, by substituting an adjectival phrase for the construct genitive relationship. I thought you'd be thrilled to hear all that. <laughs> but what it really is saying is in the very structure of the Hebrew grammar itself is an intensity of possession and a certainty of its coming. And from here... We could easily embark on a whole study, again, of the day of the Lord. But uh, we have done, we've finished studies of so many of the so-called minor prophecies, smaller prophetical books in the Old Testament, uh, Joel, Amos, Zephaniah, Malachi, all these books deal intensely with this subject. We've dealt with it before in great length, so I won't take the time here. But I do encourage you to go back and review your notes with Malachi and Joel and Amos and these other prophets that focus on this. But I do want to recount 
a few other things that I think are worth reemphasizing especially. And you might turn with me to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. This little psalm is to me one of the most fascinating psalms in the whole collection of the 150 in your Bible. It's a very strange psalm. And I suspect you will not understand it really until you sit down with a pad and paper and try to diagram it. Try to figure out who's talking to who in Psalm 2. And if you do this carefully and with insight, I think you'll discover that there are three people having a chat. The three people are the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But let's just hear the speakers, and I'll leave it to you in your casual uh, time to allocate the portions to who's speaking. Question is raised, why do the heathens, or nations, rage, and the peoples imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now, let's just pause for a minute. You know, up there in heaven, they're posing this question. Why do the nations rage and imagine this vain or stupid, idiotic thing? The kings of the earth and the rulers are taking counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Who are they talking about? Father and the Son. They're going to go to war against him. This is first of a series of passages, to me, the most mystifying passages in the Bible. I can understand the world disbelieving God. I can visualize the world rejecting God. All you do is look around. But the idea of taking up arms against God, which is what we'll find out in Revelation 16 and elsewhere, has got to be incredible. Stupid. Yeah, I don't know. What, that word isn't strong enough. You want a sort of stupid with an underline. Stupid squared or something. Yeah. Well, it goes on here then, verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his great displeasure. Yet have I set my king... Upon the holy hill of Zion. That's not symbolic, that's literal. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. He said that several times, didn't he? At his baptism, transfiguration, so forth. Verse 8. Ask of me and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Gee, how interesting. Satan offered that to him. And he turned him down. Satan said, hey, give you a shortcut. Worship me. You don't have to go to the cross. But the interesting thing about the conversation, Jesus never challenged Satan's ownership. Satan said, all the nations are given to me, and I can give them to whoever I will. I'll give them to you if you bow down and worship me. Remember that? One of the three temptations, Luke 4, Matthew 4, wherever. Interesting. No, no, the Father said, I will give thee the nations for thine inheritance and uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. You're not going to mess around. So then some advice. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. And ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are are all they that put their trust in him. Psalm 2, very interesting psalm, strange psalm. Now, from here, if you want to see how this is all going to be laid out, you read Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, through chapter 19, verse 16. The bulk of the book of Revelation amplifies these events. Chapter 1 is an introduction to Revelation. The next two chapters are letters to seven churches, which happen in their strange, mystical way to lay out all of church history. Fascinating. But chapter 4 takes us into heaven. In chapter 5, we have one receive the title deed of the earth. And he breaks the seals and takes possession of that which he purchased. And from chapter 5 through chapter 19, we have these bizarre events going on. 
And I've taught Revelation for more than 20 years. I take it very seriously. But every time I go through it, and the more I learn, the more I'm inclined to take it ever more literally for some very spooky reasons. But the point is, the day of the Lord, climaxing, of course, in the second coming of Jesus Christ in power and glory. And that's what's summarized for us here in Zechariah 14 from the point of view of the nation Israel. The nation Israel has been in, the, in focus from Zechariah 1 through 14. It's a prophecy to Israel, and we'll see it through their eyes. Now, it's also in, included in this period is a definitive period called the Great Tribulation. We call it that because that's what Jesus called it in Matthew 24. He was quoting from Daniel 12, but it's also perhaps best summarized for us in Daniel chapter 9. We've gone through this many times. This is by way of review. In Daniel chapter 9, Gabriel gives Daniel a little four-verse prophecy that's the most fantastic prophecy in the Bible. And it deals with the Messiah being presented as king. Then it's verse 25 speaks of the precise day that the Messiah would present himself as a king. We've talked about that. Verse 26 speaks of an interval between the, that period of time and a final seven-year period included in this, in this prophecy. But when you get to verse 27, it speaks of this prince that shall come, the strange leader that has, uh, as I say, 33 different allusions to him or titles of him in the Old Testament, 13 in the New. And uh, he's called here, he's called the prince that shall come. And he shall enforce the covenant, not sign a treaty. He's going to enforce the covenant with the many, is the idiom in Hebrew for Israel, for one week, the final week of years, seven-year period. And in the midst of the week, in the midst of the seven-year period, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Apparently the temple will be in operation. They will be having offerings. He will stop those in the middle of that seven-year period and set himself up to worship. Paul amplifies this for you in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. But that triggers a series of events that Jesus has much to say about. In fact, Jesus points to this particular passage when he briefs, when, when four disciples ask him for a confidential briefing of a second coming, recorded for us in three of the Gospels. We'll take it in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, first of all, warns us not to be deceived. Deception both opens and closes this passage. But he, uh, the climax of it occurs in verse 15 of Matthew 24. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, that's that event that we just read about, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, that is, in the holy of holies of the temple. Then let them who are in Judea flee into the mountains. He's not talking about people who are in Lebanon or Syria or New York or L.A. He's talking about people, let them who are in Judea flee into the mountains. Why is he focusing on Judea? We're going to find out when we get to Zechariah 14. But let's just get this background refreshed in our mind first. Jesus continues to let him who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him who is in the field return back to take his clothes. Jesus is saying, if you see this, you split and you split now. Seconds count. And woe unto them who are in, uh, with child, because they'll have a hard time getting out of there, see? And uh, to those who nurse children in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter. Pray that when this occurs, it doesn't occur in the winter. Why? Judea can be impassable during the winter. We were there one February, and it snowed, a couple of feet of snow. Precious pictures of the, uh, the Hasidim, the, uh, the Orthodox, throwing snowballs in front of the wailing wall. You know, we wanted to have T-shirts made up. We skied where Jesus walked, you know. So. <laughs> it does happen. Pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day, which is another tip-off that this passage is aimed at Jews, not Gentiles. But then Jesus goes on. For then shall be great tribulation. He's quoting a phrase from Daniel 12, first verse. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake... Those days shall be shortened, and if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. If there's a UFO behind hail Bob, don't believe it. <laughs> For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Oh boy, and here's this theme again. Deception. 
It's timely that we review this because I'm become increasingly convinced that the most gigantic deception that's ever been on the planet Earth is going to be increasingly sprung upon us over the coming weeks and months and years. Cosmic deception of a very demonic kind. Jesus warned us. Behold, I've told you before, he says. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Behold, he's behind hail Bob. Believe it not. But as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even out of the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And on he goes. And then immediately, verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, as they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other, and so forth. Now, let's get down to Zechariah verse 2. 14 verse 2. Zechariah said, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and the spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Strange passage. I will. Who's going to do this? God. He's going to actively be involved here. We have all nations, obviously representatively. What organization represents all nations today? United Nations. It's either the U.N. or maybe something that's going to come out of it. And uh, where are they gathered against? A very specific geographic location. city of Jerusalem. Not used symbolically, used very literally, as we'll quickly see this emphasized as we go on. They're going to, half the city is going to go into captivity. That's very strange, because in the past, either all went or none went. You see, and, and when they did go, they didn't leave half of them uh, there and so forth. So it's never, this, is, this is very decisive. It's never taken place. It does not fit any past overthrow of Jerusalem. Jerusalem has been overthrown 29 times throughout history. This doesn't fit any of them. Verse 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. Well, that's a strange verse. Zechariah 14.3, strange verse. Then shall the Lord go forth. The word is yatzah. And uh, he goes forth as a man of war. That's uh, Exodus 15.3. says, Our Lord is a man of war. The same term is used in Judges 14, 2 Samuel 5, Psalm 68, 108, 1 Corinthians, a number of places. Now this, in a sense, also is embodied in, the, in Zechariah's own name. You remember what Zechariah's name means? We talked about that when we started the study. God remembers. God has not forgotten Israel. And he's going to push them to extremists for his own reasons. But then shall the Lord go forth and fight against who? The Jews in Jerusalem? No. Against those nations. All of them that are encamped against the city of Jerusalem. Let me ask you just a parenthetical footnote question. Do you see Israel here as representing the church? Hardly. And yet that's so widely taught, unfortunately. Now you ask yourself, gee, well, the Lord's going to fight as he did in the day of battle. When did the Lord fight in the day of battle? We could talk about a lot of examples. Exodus 14 talks about him fighting at the Red Sea when he delivered Israel out of Egypt. He fought at Beth Horon when Joshua had the, the, when the sun stood still. We talked about that when we went through the book of Joshua in great detail. He fought during the general conquest of Canaan. I'll come back to a specific case in a minute. He fought when, when uh, Barak fought Sisera in Judges 4 and Jehoshaphat, and so forth. Hold your place here. We'll get back. But turn to Numbers 21. You know, there are a number of books that the Lord has that the Bible talks about. We have the book of the law, the Torah. We have the book of judgment. We have the book of life. How many have heard of the book of life? It's about 60%. That's exciting. We've got work to do. No, we got, okay, more, okay. There is an unusual book alluded to in the Scripture. In Numbers 21, verse 14, it says, Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord. What he did in the Red Sea and in the brooks of Arnon and goes on to me. Book of the wars. There's apparently somewhere, I don't know if anyone that has a copy, but there's somewhere, it's a book of the wars of the Lord. 
Now, I'm fond of pointing out a specific case where he fought in ways that many people don't realize. Now, we love music, and we're very indebted to the people that always bring worship here for our our studies each uh, evening that we do this. But I have to tell you that sometimes we're a victim of our music. Did you know that? Let me give you an example of that. Who fought the Battle of Jericho? Joshua. Yes. Wrong. <laughs> That's what the, uh, the song would get you to believe. But I want you to just indulge me and turn to Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. And uh, it doesn't actually say this, but I sort of visualize this, what's about to uh, reveal here, occurring after dinner. I sort of visualize Joshua, having finished dinner, uh, took a little stroll from the campfire or whatever. But anyway, um, he's by Jericho. In, in verse 13 of Joshua 5, it says, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. He's walking at night, and there's, he encounters a warrior, a man. And he's got a sword drawn. That's kind of interesting. Now Joshua immediately ran back for help. no. Joshua is the head of the army. He's inherited the franchise from Moses, crossed the Jordan through a parting of the, uh, the Jordan, circumcises the people who had for 40 years wandered around uncircumcised, and then goes on to take on these seven nations that he is going to challenge to dispossess the land. These nations were populated in part by giants, Satan's attempt since he knew that Abram had been promised this land, he populated the place with these some very strange peoples. That's why God tells him to wipe them out, every man, woman, child. He had a gene, there was a gene problem introduced, but I won't get into Genesis 6 tonight. We'll keep moving here. So Joshua is not just on guard duty. He's, a, he's the captain of the host. So what does he do when he finds this guy with a sword drawn? He challenges him like a sentry. He said to unto him, Joshua went unto him. He didn't back off. He went up to him and says, Are you for us or our adversaries? Whose side are you on, guy? Now, who is this guy that he runs into? Let's look at verse 14 very carefully. And he, the person, said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. Now, don't get confused by the term captain. We tend in our vocabulary to visualize that as a field grade officer. We're talking flag rank here. Number one, it says, as captain of the host of the Lord, now I am. Get that? They, I, it needs to be really paraphrased to do it right. In the Hebrew. It's the an I am statement. Where would Joshua remember that from? Forty years earlier, he was with Moses on Mount Sinai. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now many people, just reading a Bible casually, would say, Gee, this must be some kind of super angel or something. Maybe it's Michael. He's supposed to be the captain of... He's, uh, he's the military commander in, in, in Israel's interest. Someone who's knowledgeable about the role of Michael could validly point that out. Except there's something strange going on here. Angels do not allow themselves to be worshipped. One did and got into a lot of trouble. So this is not an angel. Because he encourages himself to be worshipped. Who is this guy? He's Jesus Christ. And he deliberately uses the idioms that Joshua will remember from 40 years earlier when he, Jesus, was the voice of the burning bush. He said so in John 8. Loose thy foot from off the shoe. That's exactly what he said to Moses at that time. So Joshua has figured this out pretty quickly. He's a quick learn. What saith my Lord unto his servant? So it's hard for us to imagine Jesus personally Oh, sure, God is behind the battles. He makes sure it comes out the way he wants, all that sort of thing. Sure. No, this is more specific. He is there in person, not incarnate. Don't get confused. The incarnation is still yet future. But he's there in a tangible form of some kind. Now, the more you study the battle of Jericho, the stranger it becomes. The Ark of the Covenant was not supposed to go to war. It led the procession. The Levites were exempt from military duty, but they lead the procession around the... They march around... Once a day for six days. And the seventh day, they march around seven times. I thought the seventh day was holy. They're supposed to do no work. 
If you study carefully Jericho coming up in chapter 6, you'll discover almost every law of the Torah is broken. What is Jesus doing? He's doing the same thing he did at the wedding at Cana. Declaring himself the Lord of the Torah. Wedding of Cana, he finally turns water into wine. The water he uses is the water of purification. Had the ashes of the red heifer in it. He was demonstrating he was the Lord of the Torah. Not to them, to his disciples. They're the only ones who knew what was going on. What's the Lord doing here? Proving he's Lord of the Torah. Jericho turns out to be a model of the book of Revelation. You study, I mean, the whole book of Joshua is. It's, very, it's a worthy study, but let's not get derailed any further. We better be, move on. Now, as I said, if you're really going to study this, in theory, what you would do is go from Revelation chapter 5, where Jesus receives his title deed for what he purchased at the cross, and we have all these judgments being poured out and so forth, and of course, it ultimately gets climaxed in chapter 19 of Revelation. And when you get to Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, we read the following. John says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that it, with it he did smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. A vesture dipped in blood. Whose blood? Not his, his was shed. 2,000 years earlier. The blood of his enemies. In Isaiah 63, we'll take a quick peek at that. I was going to do it a little later because it's going to come up again in Zechariah 14. But uh, let's just turn to Isaiah 63. And it's a very, very strange chapter that many people don't know what to make of. Isaiah 63, Who is this that cometh from Edom? That's from the east. That's not the Mount of Olives. That's the east. With dyed garments from Basra. The word Basra means sheepfold. You can read that Petra if you like. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Who is that? Who is, speaks in righteousness. Who is he that is able to save? Who is that? Not Mary, despite the... (laughs) I understand the Pope's going to make this announcement that Mary is the mediatrix and so forth. There's there's speculation about that. Well, uh, anyway, who is who is the one mighty to save? Jesus Christ, indeed. Verse two: Why art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him who treadeth the wine fat? Meaning the people that you know drop the the grapes in the wine, you know they get red stained. He looks like that, except it's blood, not wine. Verse 3, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the peoples there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, and I will trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And on he goes. Strange passage. He goes to Edom first to deal with the remnant, because this whole centroid of focus by the Antichrist on Jerusalem is not really after Jerusalem, it's after the remnant. Because one of the preconditions to the second coming is for the remnant to repent and ask him to come. Hosea 5.15 deals with that in other passages. And he first, he waits three days and then he nails him there. And then he goes from there for his victory announcement at Mount of Olives, which is verse 4 of Zechariah 14. Let's continue. You didn't think I'd get back there, did you? Zechariah 14, verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. His feet. He's not coming as a spirit or an influence. His feet. And they're going to have wounds in them. They'll have scar tissue. They say the only thing man made in heaven are scars. His. His feet shall stand at that day on the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is not a generic place. It's a specific location. It's about... um, a couple hundred feet above Jerusalem, about 300 feet above uh, Mount Moriah on the east. Now, something strange happens to the Mount Moriah. We know from geodetic studies that the Mount of Olives has a fault in it running east and west. There's a tension in that mountain. 
And that tension is waiting for the touch of a foot. Whose? His, you betcha. The Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it towards the south. It's going to split, putting a valley going eastward from Jerusalem. By the way, I'm not going to take time on this whole detailed Armageddon scenario. We have a briefing package called The Next Holocaust and the Refuge in Edom, which goes through a lot of this background that many students of prophecy may have missed. In that day, his his feet shall touch. In that day, there's that phrase again. It occurs in the passages that were in 12, 13, 14, this passage of Zechariah. In that day occurs 17 times, at least. The word Jerusalem occurs 22 times. The nations are referenced 13 times. Now, by the way, it may surprise you to know that this is the only place the Mount of Olives is explicitly mentioned in the Old Testament. Not surprised we hear that so often. That's a New Testament frequency. This is the only place in the Old Testament. There is a mention in 2 Samuel... The ascent of olives, which is the same thing, but it's technically not quite the... I mean, it's, it's equivalent, really. And as I say, it's the highest peak in the area. Now, it's interesting that he comes back there for his victory announcement. Why? Because that's where he left from. Remember Acts chapter 1? Why do you stand gazing to heaven, guys? There's two angels that show up. Angels are always in pairs, right? You notice that? They're with the Lord in Genesis 18 when they visit Abraham. And the two, go, the two angels go off to Sodom and Gomorrah to run a little errand. They're in the tomb. There's always two angels. Well, here again, uh, when he's uh, ascension, the two angels. Why you stand against heaven, the same Jesus shall so come in like manner, as you have seen, he's going to come. Uh, interesting. He really is. This isn't a, a poetic uh, euphemism of some kind. In Luke 24, 50, it mentions it, and also in Acts uh, chapter 1, 9 through 12. Now, interestingly enough, if you study the temple... The Shekinah, the the glory, the cloud that filled Solomon's temple, departed. And Ezekiel describes that in chapter 11 and chapter 43. How it it came from the east there the first time. But as it finally, when the glory departs, it departs hesitatingly over the temple wall and then departs to the east again. So even not only did Jesus come and go from there, so did the Shekinah, interestingly enough. And, of course, there's an earthquake in Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and the Psalms all talk about the earthquake. And, of course, the seventh bowl in Revelation, chapter 16, deals with that. Verse 5, in Zechariah 45, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal, and ye ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Now, this location of Zal is probably Beth Ezel, and I mentioned in Micah 1.11 for what that's worth. Now, the flight here is compared. You're going to flee, he says, just as you did in the days of Uzziah. There was an earthquake in the days of Uzziah that was apparently very severe. It must have been quite severe because that was 200 years before the time of Zechariah. And it was so still emblazoned in their minds, he could use it as an idiom of reference. So... Um, that uh, Josephus relates the catastrophe and Uzziah's reign to King Uzziah's attempt to offer incense in the temple against the protests of the priests. So that was quite an earthquake. And there's also, of course, an earthquake associated with the Mount of Olives parting. And there's also an earthquake frequently referred to in the book of Revelation. It's almost like a set of milestones there. Now, it says that he shall come and all the saints with thee. Now we've got an interesting little problem, because when Jesus comes back, who does he come back with? Now you discover in Matthew 24, he comes back with the angels, clearly. But he also comes back with some other people. Now, by the way, see, you understand the word saints, the Gedoshim, refers to separated ones, those that are set apart for service. The angels, certain, the good angels, the heavenly angels, are set apart for God's service. So they fit that description. But so do holy men, even in the Old Testament. Psalm 16 and 34, Leviticus 11, 19, 20. There's a bunch of these. They'll be in your notes for those of you who want to track this down. But uh, you might uh, turn with me, if you will, to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 15 is probably the most important chapter in the Bible, according to Paul. 
Because without 1 Corinthians 15, we, are, we have zip. It deals with it's the resurrection chapter, very key chapter. More important than most people realize. But anyway, verse 23 of this famous chapter. But every man in his... Oh, first of all, it's verse 22 starts. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Well, let's see. That's pretty good, but I don't doesn't know that does that necessarily mean that they're coming with them. Well, let's keep looking here a little bit. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 13. Uh, last verse of chap- 1 Thessalonians 3. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even your Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So Jesus is going to in a second coming is coming with all his saints. That seems pretty clear, doesn't it? Now, I've got a problem here. Because many people teach and sincerely believe, including some good Bible teachers, teach. They tend to put together the rapture of the church and the second coming. They don't see them as separate. Well, if the dead in Christ rise first, and then we who are alive and remain are gathered in the clouds, but he's coming, got a couple of problems. It's sort of a quick turnaround, isn't it? It also, as Kenny Poor sort of flippantly said, it makes the marriage supper of the lamb a snack lunch. <laughs> and of course he's kidding, but he makes the point. You see, it, it, you begin to feel that, gee, there's something, maybe there's something we're not getting here. And of course the point is that there's a, the, the, the marriage supper of the lamb takes place first before we return with them, which means we have to be gathered prior to his second coming. Don't confuse the gathering of the saints of the church, the dead in Christ with the second coming, because that's preparatory to him taking over, coming in power. When we say second coming, we, what we technically mean is his coming in power to take over, set up his kingdom. is exactly what Zechariah has in view. Turn with me to Revelation 19 again. Now, I want you to notice in Revelation 19, climactic chapter in Revelation, verses 7 through 9 deal with the marriage supper of the Lamb. If you skim through quickly, 7, 8, and 9, what should we read? Let's be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Important phrase. For the fine linen is what? The righteousness of the saints. And he saith to me, Right, blessed are they who are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. He saith unto me, They are the true sayings of God. And I fell on his feet to worship him. He said to me, See thou do it not. See, his escort is an angel. For I am a fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then verses 11 through 16, we just read as a second coming in power. What happens just before the second coming in power? The marriage supper of the Lamb. Where's the bride during the marriage supper? <laughs> At the supper. Okay? So hallelujah is right. Right on. Okay? So the point is, is, there's all this discussion about who comes back with the Lord at second coming. Angels or the saints? Answer, both of them. Both of them. The angels will also be in the retinue of the king. Uh, Matthew 16, chapter 25, Mark 8, Luke 9, or places that mentions it. And by the way, um, Peter compares all this with the worldwide flood of Noah, which is interesting, because this is certainly worldwide. But he compares the flood of Noah, which is also what? Worldwide. There are experts, or apparently so, that say that uh, Noah's flood was a local flood. No, it was a worldwide flood. It's always used that way in Scripture. In fact, God gives Noah a rainbow as a symbol of his commitment that he'll never do that again. Well, if it turned out to be a regional flood, God didn't keep his promise. There have been lots of regional floods. But there's never been a worldwide flood. That's the key point. It's important to read the footnotes. Now, one other thing about where this has all been a digression from uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5. But I want you to notice how verse 5 ends. It's just before the All Saints with you. It says, And the Lord my God shall come. The Lord my God. What does that remind you of, that phrase? Remember when we were in Zechariah 13, 6? One shall say unto them, what are these wounds in thy hands? Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends, alluding to, I believe, Thomas's unbelief. Remember? Unless I put my finger in the wounds and so forth. 
And, and Thomas gives this incredible declaration, my Lord and my God. And uh, I hear that same echo in verse 5. But let's move on to verse 6, Zechariah 14, 6. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. But it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. In verse 8, and it shall be in that day the living water. Well, let's, let's pick up a few things. There are going to be major cosmic changes. And uh, we could go through Isaiah 13, 24, Joel 3, Matthew 24, and on. And of course, in Revelation chapter 6 and 8 and so forth, there's going to be major cosmic changes in the uh, heavens. And uh, we see that there's going to be something strange. I might call it a global twilight. It seems to be sort of light at night and not... Bright in the day, it's sort of something strange going on. Uh, And um, Zephaniah talks about that. They they had a day like this in Egypt in the the plagues, Exodus 15, verse 8. Job also mentions a day like this, sort of. But this one is going to be unique and unparalleled in human history. Ezekiel talks about that as being unique in Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 5. But maybe another passage that we'll want to look at anyway is in Jeremiah 30. There's several reasons to look at Jeremiah. This again is, I think, by way of review for most of you. But in uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, it deals with this period. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 5. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man doth travel with child. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins, like a woman in travail, and all faces turned into paleness? Alas! For that day is great, so that none is like it. See, there's that again. We always see the, all through this, these Old Testament passages, it mentions that this day is absolutely unique. No, for, for none is like it. So it is even the time of Jacob's trouble. That's an Old Testament phrase for the tribulation. Same thing, the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. Well, let's, let's turn to Isaiah 30. Pick up a few of these. Your notes will have uh, plenty of other references that you can track down if you want to get into more background. You'll be surprised to discover how much they echo back and forth the same thing. But Isaiah chapter 30, verse 26, Isaiah says, Moreover, the light of the moon shall be like the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold like the light of seven days in the day which the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people and healeth the stroke of their wound. Now, what's really going on here? There may be far more going on here than most people realize. You might turn with me to Romans chapter 8. There's some strange insights tucked away in Romans 8. We always read uh, Romans 8.28 to the end as encouragement. Indeed, it's one of the most incredible passages in the Scripture. But this time I'd like to just focus from verse 18 and following for a few. Paul says... For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now, it's interesting. He says that the creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of decay or the bondage of corruption. There are some that believe this might be an allusion to the entropy laws, the second law of thermodynamics which says that the, you know, everything's winding down from, from order to disorder, from design into chaos, and so on. The entropy laws are well observed in every field of science. The only field of science that chooses to ignore them is, of course, the field of uh, biology or biogenesis or evolution. But everywhere else in science, we acknowledge and recognize in, uh, the bondage of decay, the, the entropy laws. This suggests, if that is correct, that maybe even, even the basic laws of physics may be revised when uh, the entropy laws may be lifted at the second coming. That's a bizarre idea. There are many people, that, quite knowledgeable people, that would take exception to that. 
I say, let's stand back and watch. It won't be long to find out. Going on to Zechariah 14, verse 8, And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea, in summer and in winter shall it be. So at this splitting of the Mount of Olives, there are going to be major changes in topology in that region, maybe on the whole earth. Who knows? And there's actually going to be waters. Jerusalem right now is a very arid place. There's no, no harbor, no river, nothing around Jerusalem. And yet that's all going to change. There's going to be living waters, meaning running waters, fresh water, running to the former, both the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea, both ways. There's going to be a flow of water. Now, waters also speak of purification, of spiritual life and refreshment. You'll find it often used there in Ezekiel 47, Joel 3, Revelation 22, the, the final portrayal of heaven is, is with this living water. And uh, it's interesting that people who forsake God are referred to in Jeremiah as if they were cisterns unable to hold water. See, in that part of the country, rainwater was so precious that what you typically did is develop cisterns, huge underground caverns to hold water when it did come so you'd have the water for the year. When they had these rains, it would come heavy while they would capture that water. Well, what could happen to a cistern, if it developed a crack or a fault, it would leak and would fail and you'd die because you wouldn't be able to hold the water and during the hot season you wouldn't have water and it's a matter of survival. And so Jeremiah in chapter 2 and also in chapter 17 refers to people who forsake God as people who are like a cistern that uh, uh, is uh, broken. It's unable to retain the water. But don't confuse that idiom because I don't want to confuse you. The living water is fresh running water, however. Now the water here is clearly literal because it flows to the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. And yet at the same time, it also may be referring to spiritual. You'll discover a number of references, and I won't bother taking you through them now, where the same references in both Isaiah and Ezekiel, if you compare them, uh, the refreshment, the literal water restoring the people, and uh, the water restoring the land are spiritual and literal both together. The idioms are in effect intertwined. And you may also recall that um, Jesus made the same allusions in uh, John 4 and John 7, speaking of living water, of, uh, speaking of the Spirit of God, using that phrase. But let's just move on. Verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Zechariah 49, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. What a phrase. Wouldn't that be exciting? In that day shall there be one Lord and His name one. He alone will be worshipped. Isaiah emphasized that. Daniel emphasized that. Revelation 11, 15 others. It's interesting that the, one of the most venerated prayers in the Old Testament is the Shema. Out of Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and following. The Shema. The, uh, Hear, O Israel, our Lord is one. And indeed, at this time, finally, this plan of redemption is unfolding. The world will be redeemed. There will be one Lord. He alone will be worshipped. It's interesting. Zephaniah 3, 9 says, In that day there will be a pure language. Some scholars say that that phrase in the Hebrew means Hebrew. There's many that believe that Hebrew will be the final universal language. In any case, there will be a universal language, it appears. Verse 10 of Zechariah. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place, from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's wine presses. Notice, first of all, we're talking about a literal kingdom here. We're not talking about a, a poetic phrase for the church or something. We're talking about a land that will be laid plain from Geba to Rimen and goes through the boundaries of the city of Jerusalem. Now, the land shall be returned as a plain. Some of your translations may say uh, as a plain. It's the Araba, the deep rift, the great rift as it's called, from the Dog River and the coast of north of Beirut and Lebanon, uh, above the Sea of Galilee, through the Jordan Valley, down through the Dead Sea, down to the Gulf of Aqaba, and on to North Africa. This is the Great Rift. It's considered the deepest depression on the planet Earth. And it is mentioned a number of times in the Scripture. The Arabah, if you will. Now this Giva, or Jiva, is six miles northeast of Jerusalem. It's, uh, it's in the region called that would be called the tribe of Benjamin's region. Mentioned in Joshua 18. Rimmon is a, is a specific place, 33 miles southwest of Jerusalem, mentioned in Joshua and in First Chronicles. Uh, it's a few miles south of Ziklag. Now, it was inhabited when they came back from the exile, which means it was inhabited in the days of Zechariah. You notice it says uh, Rimmon south of Jerusalem. That's because there was another Rimmon up in Galilee that could be confused with it. The word uh, Rimmon, by the way, means pomegranate, for what, those of you that might care about that. 
It also says Jerusalem will be lifted up. Micah chapter 4 verse 1 mentions that. And it's also probably fulfilled Psalm 48, which talks about Jerusalem being lifted. There's major changes going on here. The boundaries will include Benjamin's gate. That was in the north wall of the city. It's sometimes called the gate of Ephraim because through that gate you'd go through Benjamin to Ephraim. So it has both labels in 2 Kings 14 and elsewhere. Then to the first gate, which is in the northeast corner of the city. Then to the corner gate, mentioned in 2 Kings 14, Jeremiah 31. It's northwest corner of the city. To the tower of Hananiel, which is near the northeast corner of the wall. And some early commentator says this has to be figurative because they don't, they've never been able to find it. Well, archaeologists have since found the Tower of Hananiel. We know where it is. Uh, also to the wine press of the king that was southeast of the corner of the king's gardens near the Pool of Siloam. The point is, without getting into a map and all this, these are specific boundaries of a literal city. These details imply this is not figurative language. This is literal. Verse 11, And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. It says there shall be no more utter destruction. What it really, the word harem in the Hebrew means an accursed thing or an involuntary dedication to utter destruction. Or really the word might be properly translated the curse. There shall be no more curse. So that's kind of consistent with the idea of the uh, whole idea. See, the, I believe the entropy laws were introduced in Genesis chapter 3. Some scientists tell us today that the speed of light has not always been, it, it previously was faster. It's been slowing down uh, on a very specific mathematical curve throughout the centuries. Now, I won't get into the whole speed of light thing, but the point is there are some of us that suspect the possibility is that in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam fell and God introduced the curse as a result of that sin, a lot of things changed. We have very little insight in the creation prior to Genesis chapter 3. We only have seen the creation post-curse. But one of the aspects of that curse may indeed have been several things. One is the introduction of the entropy laws in the present form that we take for granted. And also, the other thing, it may also um, have uh, included the speed of light slowing down. Uh, it may have started in Genesis 3. Those two may be linked some way. Uh, as the, the, the speed of light and uh, entropy, the product of those are Planck's constant. So if entropy is increasing, speed of light may be slowing down, they may be linked. And the whole idea of the entropy laws being introduced and the speed of light slowing down may be intrinsically linked together. Something else, it says that Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Not only a sense of freedom from war, it's also our understanding the demons will be bound. We mentioned that last time, uh, Zechariah 13.2 is the only place in the Old Testament, or in the Bible, I guess, where the demons are also considered bound, just as Satan, of course, is very explicitly bound in the book of Revelation. We know today that we're subject to the pranks and mischief of the demons. 1 Timothy 4, Paul warns Timothy of the doctrines of demons. I believe, personally, that much of this, not all, but some of this UFO stuff are hoaxes, some of this is disinformation by certain groups, but behind all this, there are some very real things happening. I believe they're demonic. And I think they're going to get more and more intense as time goes on. I think 1 Timothy 4 warns us about this, 1 John 4 and James 3, 15, other passages. But at this point, with Christ coming back, there'll be security in Jerusalem for the first time in its history. But then verse 12 of Zechariah 14 has some very timely technology. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. That's a weird passage. Yes, it's kind of uh, distasteful, I understand. But what they're saying, not only do they rot, they rot instantly. See, while they're standing on their feet. They're not laying in the sun and, you know... It's an instantaneous consumption, so to speak. It's interesting that when you get down to verse 15, you'll discover it happens not just to the nations against Jerusalem. It says, verse 15 says, So shall be the plague of the horse and of the mule and the camel and the ass and all the beasts that are in these tents as this plague. Why the animals too? They didn't do anything wrong, right? There is a possibility, a conjecture, but I'll just mention it in passing, that this might be... Uh, a description of a neutron bomb. Those of you that have studied uh, uh, modern weaponry know that there is a form of nuclear weapon that is a, a form of radiation that's neutrons only, and it has a, some peculiar attributes. It, the neutrons can pass through building walls without destroying the buildings, but they destroy protein. A neutron bomb is an anti-personnel 
very, very incredibly powerful anti-personnel weapon. And it uh, literally consumes flesh only because of the nature of the physics involved. Now, it's interesting that the United States, in some kind of humanitarian posture, has decided not to develop that technology. But there are two countries that have worked hard and developed viable working neutron bombs. I'm not speaking out of school. I think I'm safe ground here. The two countries that have neutron bombs are the Russians and Israel. Kind of interesting. Kind of interesting. So is this a neutron bomb? Not necessarily. God can do what he likes. But on the other hand, it might be evidence of this kind of technology. The shocking rapidity is part of the dynamic here. And um, uh, because most of the corruption, like in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 and other places, are slow, different. This is instantaneous, something very unique. Anyway, going on to verse 13. It shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. This business of having the enemy get confused and fighting among themselves is a very common description in the, in the Scripture. We find it in Judges 7, 1 Samuel 14, and other places. You know, Gideon, there's a number of places. In Gideon, uh, the enemy did, you know, through his thing, the enemy got confused and wiped themselves out. And um, Gingham Dog and the Caligo Cat, I guess. Anyway, um, in, in, in uh, 1 Samuel 14, Jonathan the armor bearer, that famous story. Interesting, uh, same, similar kind of thing. So somehow God again, as he has in the past, causes the enemies to fight among themselves and, and destroy themselves. Verse 14, And Judah shall also fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. So this wealth is very tangible, very specific. Verse 15, And so shall be the plague of the horse and the mule, the camel, the ass, and all the beasts that shall be in these tents as this plague. And I think that's an echo, of obviously, from verse 12 on. Verse 16, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Wow, that's it. That's strange. Feast of Tabernacles is going to be mentioned three times in this chapter. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles, I think we all, you all know there's seven feasts of Israel. Three in the first month, the month of Nisan. Three in the seventh month, month of Tishri, and one in between. They're all prophetic. The first three in the, in the first month are prophetic of the Lord Jesus Christ, His first coming. The last three in the seventh month are prophetic of His second coming. The one in between speaks of the church. It's the only feast in the, in the Torah that deals with leavened bread. And it uh, uh, speaks of, uh, uh, in, in advance, if you will, of the church. And, of course, on Acts 2, when was the church born? On the Feast of Pentecost, or Feast of uh, Shavuot, if you will. Now, of the seven feasts of Israel, only three were compulsory, mandatory attendance. And that was the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the only one mentioned in the millennium, the only one mentioned here and on, is the Feast of Tabernacles. Why? Because Passover has been fulfilled. It prophesied and then was of Christ and was fulfilled at the cross. Okay? Feast of Pentecost was prophesying the church, and it's possible, some people suspect, that maybe even the church will be raptured at the Feast of Pentecost because of some peculiar thoughts. But in any case, in any case, at this time, the second coming, that's also passed one way or the other. Okay? The only one that's of the mandatory feast that's unfulfilled is the Feast of Tabernacles, and it is being fulfilled from here, continuing. Now, it was, of course, celebrated when they came back from the exile. It is the feast of the millennial age. Revelation chapter 22 is a chapter that focuses on that, but most of what we know about the millennium comes out of Isaiah 65 and other passages. So it's interesting that the Feast of Tabernacles is emphasized here. And if you want more background on this, we also have a briefing package called the Feasts of Israel, where we try to go in not just the historical, but also the prophetic implications of these feasts that God has appointed. He ordained them in, in, with some surprising detail that has prophetic implications. Paul told us that all these things are a shadow of things to come, so we know they're prophetic. And I encourage you to dig into that if you haven't done that. Verse 17, And it shall be that whosoever shall not come of all the families of the earth unto the Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. In other words, if some nation, obviously not everybody goes, but they send representatives, so there's a representation. If they decline to do that, they've got problems because the world is dependent upon rain. All except one nation. I'll come back to that. 
Now, uh, see that rain is withheld as a, a punishment for lack of obedience. And um, there will be some sin, though, even in the millennium. That's a mystery. There will be feigned obedience, um, some form of li- feigned obedience is a form of lying. And there will be feigned obedience then, even as there is now. Not all church members are Christians, etc. But there's one nation that doesn't rely on rain for their crops. That's Egypt. It relies on the overflowing of the Nile. So then if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, they shall have no rain. There shall, uh, that have no rain, there shall be a plague wherewith the Lord shall smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So Egypt singled out to point out even those that aren't dependent on rain, the Lord has his ways. <laughs> Verse 19, this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to the, keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This is a very stern note. It echoes Zechariah chapter 5. Remember the flying roll and all of that. It's the rod of iron rule of the Messiah that is uh, in view here. Verse 20. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. What this is trying to get across is it's going to be a dismissal of this concept of sacred and secular. See, today we have things that are set aside for Lord and things that are secular. No, no. In that day, they'll all be the same. Even the pots, you see, in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls you know, before the altar. They're all going to be holy, in other words. And uh, they'll be all be sanctified before the Lord. See, where holiness prevails, ceremonial sanctity is not necessary. Verse 21, Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and and see therein. And in that day there shall be no more Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Now the word Canaanite is used here idiomatically. What it, it generally was used for the Phoenicians that was north of Canaan. They were noted mariners and merchants of the ancient world. And they were known for their ungodly and unholy ways. So it's Hosea 12.7 is one of the references there. This is sort of an inverted way of saying that all will be holy. Now... Zechariah opened the book. In about chapter 2, he said, Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. That's where Zechariah early gets our attention. Early says, Hey, the Lord is in focus here. And he's carried us through in a very consistent structure through the night visions of the first six chapters and through the priestly council of 7 8. And then with this climactic buildup from chapter 9 through 14. He climaxes with the time of the restitution of all things. That's a phrase that occurs twice. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6, remember when, when Jesus was getting ready to, to ascend, they asked him, are you now going to restore? In fact, let's, let's just take a quick look at that. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Many people don't really understand what he said there. Acts chapter 1, picking it up about verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard from me. For John truly baptized with the water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And indeed in chapter 2 it deals with that. But verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, this is the Lord, in his resurrection body just before his ascension. Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. And he goes on. Notice what he says there. He doesn't deny that's going to happen. Many people don't pick up on that. He sort of gives them a put down. It's not for you to know the times and the seasons. What he's saying, it's coming. It's not for you to know when. That is what Zechariah is dealing with. The time of the restitution of all things. Now, Peter, as you know, Acts chapter 2, we have the Holy Spirit given. Many people you see that, of course, as the birth of the church as such, as such. And Peter gives his first sermon in Acts chapter 2. And I encourage you to study that, not just for its content, but for a manifestation of the Spirit of God in another way. If you remember Peter, all through the Gospels, always fumbles. You know, we always joke that he has foot and mouth disease. The only time he opens his mouth is to change feet, as some people say. He always seems to be saying the wrong thing at the right time or vice versa, right? 
But then when you see after he receives the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, he gives up a sermon. And that sermon is eloquent, well-organized, articulate. And if you've really studied Peter, it should catch you by surprise. This is the same guy? But one of the more interesting sermons to me is his second sermon in Acts chapter 3. There was a lame man and, that is healed and so forth. And uh, the second sermon starts in Acts chapter 3 verse 12. I won't go the whole, through, the whole thing. But uh, he calls in verse 19, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come upon the, uh, uh, from the presence of the Lord. Times of refreshing. That's interesting. And he shall send Jesus Christ, who, who before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until... There's another one of these untils. The heavens are going to receive until what? Until the times of the restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of the holy prophets since the age began. And then he goes on. Time of the restitution of all things. The Jubilee year anticipated all of this. The concept of the Jubilee year was one in which all debts were forgiven... All land returned to its original grantors, uh, grantees, I should say, and uh, all that's forgiven, all, and all slaves go free. If you were indentured servitude, if you in slavery to pay off a debt, Jubilee went free. It was a time of restitution of all things. That's going to happen to the cosmos at this time. The term restitution of all things appears only twice, uh, apacatastasis. I'm not pronouncing it properly, I'm sure. Um, that's both in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, and it's also in Acts 3, verse 27. So Zechariah has done the same thing that Revelation does from chapter 4 through 19. Zechariah has done from chapter 1 through chapter 14. And so um, we all might do the same thing that Thomas did. We studied last time the whole idea that uh, what wounded Christ was not the nails in his hands. What wounded Christ was Thomas's unbelief. So in, in Zechariah 13, 6, it says, One shall say to them, What are these wounds on their hands? Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. He's not talking about the Roman spikes. He's talking about Thomas's unbelief. And so indeed, when Thomas rejoined them in that second visit, Jesus shows up and goes to Thomas and says, Thomas, hey, here they are. That must have shaken Thomas up to realize that the Lord heard those words. It may, it's probably startles us to really realize that every word, every idle word we say, every time that we are out of sorts, for whatever reason, Jesus knows it. He's there. And uh, we, like Thomas, should maybe tonight also, in effect, bow our hearts before the throne of God and simply say, my Lord and my God. Because he's coming. The climax is coming. The world has no idea of what's coming. And the deception... The cosmic deception that's coming upon the earth, I think, is taking shape more clearly day by day and week by week. I think the world is going to increasingly be lured into a form of occultic worship deriving from this New Age view that's so prevalent throughout our culture. And uh, I think whether it's uh, NASA discoveries, whether it is the intervention in our society of demonic behavior of several different kinds, it's coming. And I think the disturbing part of this will be within the body of Christ because I think those that are weakly grounded, those that are, uh, not, haven't done their homework, are going to get shaken loose. I think there's going to be a very, very heavy time forthcoming. I think it's in absolutely essential that we take the fair weather we've got now to get ready for the coming storm. How do we do that? By getting into Ephesians 6 and taking it seriously putting on the whole armor of God and understanding what truth really is, understanding the breastplate of righteousness, what it really is, repairing your shield of faith and learning how to use your sword of the Spirit and to understand your helmet of salvation and so forth and understand the power you have in your heavy artillery, namely prayer. Understand Ephesians 6. I think it is going to be critical. But the exciting time, it's all going to happen. It's all coming. God says what he means and means what he says. World history is going to turn on Israel. All the nations will come against Israel. And Israel, half the city, it'll be divided. Half the city will go into slavery. The nations are going to muck around in a piece of real estate that God has called his own. And the point is, he's going to get to the point where enough's enough. And he's going to nail them. And it's coming. Praise his name. Even so, come Lord Jesus, Maranatha. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. 
Father, we come before your throne like Thomas in our simplicity, simply declaring, My Lord and my God. Father, we know that you are God. We know that you have a limitation on your patience with the world. There will be a time when you will no longer strive with man, when the day of vengeance indeed has come, when that unique period of time, your time, will be upon the planet Earth. And Father, we also recognize that the day of vengeance is coming. And we thank you, Father, that when Jesus declared his mandate in Isaiah 61, that he stopped at the comma. That comma leaving an interval in which we could come to repentance and be born again into your forever family. We thank you, Father, for that redemption that you have gone to such extremes to provide us. We thank you, Father, that we are here before your throne by your divine appointment. And, Father, we do acknowledge before you our sins, for they are many. Sins of presumption, sins of ingratitude, sins of deliberate disobedience. But we confess it before you, Father, and we repent of them. We do ask you, Father, in fact, we plead the blood of Jesus Christ, that we might be cleansed and forgiven, knowing indeed that you are faithful, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Father, we do indeed seek your garments, linen, white, and clean, not by our righteousness, but the righteousness that's imputed to us through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for our salvation. And yet, Father, we would ask that you teach us how to use that salvation for your kingdom. Help us, Father, to be effective servants in the days that remain. Help us, Father, to declare your purposes. Help us, Father, to be sensitive to that unique ministry you have for each one of us. To be fruitful for your kingdom, not by power nor by might, but by your spirit, Father. We do pray that you would just reignite in each of us a flame of passion for your word and for the things of you. Through your Holy Spirit, Father, we would ask that you'd help each of us to continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Redeemer, our Savior, our Messiah that we might be more responsive to your will in our lives moment by moment and day by day, and thus more pleasing in thy sight. We ask these things, Father, in the authority and under the instruction you have given us. Indeed, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah of Israel. Do indeed, Lord, come quickly. 